Good morning, everybody. It's an unexpected pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, I didn't expect to be here, uh, but Friday morning came and uh, you were not going to have anybody. And I thought, right, I will come. So you've got to blame me twice, really, uh, for being with you. But it's a great Sunday to be together because we're celebrating Christ the King. Uh, next Sunday's Advent Sunday. And on Advent Sunday, we start in the darkness with just a little flame of hope and promise. And we, we face that darkness, everything that would oppress us and keep us down and damage us and diminish us. And we get to Christmas and God says, right, I'm coming myself. As in that promise in Ezekiel, God says, I'm going to come and find you. And at Christmas, in Jesus, we see God coming to us. And then during Lent, we reflect on what that means. And then at Easter, the worst that life and death can throw at us happens on Good Friday. And the very worst we can face or imagine is thrown at Jesus. And on Easter Day, he's risen. There is nothing love cannot face. On Easter Day, God's love overcomes the worst that we can imagine or face or live through. And then, after that, it's party time in the life of the church. And we go to Pentecost, and the Spirit is poured out. And we rejoice, and we change the world, and we go into every part of the world. And we work for justice and peace and hope and light. And we get to today and we say, yes, Christ is our king. He has overcome. He is the king of heaven. And then next Sunday, we do it all over again because we start in the darkness and the emptiness and the bleakness with a little candle flame. So today is a brilliant day. It's a really optimistic day when we say, yes, Christ, you are our king. Could we have the first one, please, Chris? So, that painting is by Edgar Degas, the great French Impressionist, and it's called Absinthe, after the drink that's in the glass in front of the woman sitting there. Uh, absinthe was rather like rocket fuel. It was incredibly potent and really damaging. And in fact, absinthe was banned in France until comparatively recently. What do you see in her face? Sadness. Misery, lost, despair, depression, hopelessness. The lostness of the world that we recognise. Dagan was a genius with a couple of flicks of paint. Look what he's put into her eyes. And we recognise that. We don't have to be told, do we? We feel it. We recognise it. And what's going on between the two of them? Not a lot. They're about six inches apart, but it may as well be light years of distance. <coughs> Nothing going on. It is a real work of genius to portray the lostness of the humanity that we recognise, our story. And Jesus, almost in passing, when he's in conversation reveals to us that same passion that the prophet Ezekiel is saying is from the heart of God. For Jesus says to us, look, I came for this purpose and this purpose alone, to seek and to save the lost. Were you moved by the video? A wordless parable. Do you know the thing about that video? It was an advert for LG televisions in Portugal. Mm -hmm. It was an advert. Do you know, I wish we had adverts like that here. <laughs> an advert with heart, with story, with passion. Because you didn't need it explained to you, did you? You get it, the lostness and the beauty of the video. Every single person we saw was necessary for that person to be saved and brought back to know life again. Every side, my favourite, I think, is the guy in the car who goes, yes, on it. Wonderful evocation 
of what's in the heart of God, what's in Jesus' heart to seek and save the lost. Next one, Chris, if we could. So God says to us, I myself will find my sheep and rescue them. Which part of that don't we understand? It's really clear, isn't it? That's what God says God is going to do. And when God says God's going to do something, what does God do? He does it. And he does it all the time. For everybody. God's passion to find the sheep. And this passion that God has is the passion we see in Jesus. And it's the passion that he offers to you and me as the church. This is what we're about, isn't it? It's why Jesus has a church. Next one, Chris, if we could. So there we are, it's the same sheep, up, uh, up above Coniston on the fells in the Lake District. And uh, you can tell who's doing the work, can't you, in this shot? It's the Border Collie at bottom right. <laughs> There were actually two of them. They were doing all the work, getting the sheep together. And those shepherds, the guys were there. You know, well, it's this one and it's that one. And we do that with that one. And they were separating them out. And, of course, it's an image Jesus would have been familiar with. And he, he's saying, is Ezekiel, that God's passion is actually to save everybody and that that is what the founder of John Wesley that's uh, founder of John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, called social holiness. Yes, God wants to rescue and save us, and actually that is about relationships. It's about economics, it's about politics, it's about everything that constitutes our common life. That's what God is saying. Because in that text, and Dave, it's brilliant, isn't it? Isn't it a fantastic text? You know, because God is saying, yeah, I'm coming to get you, but actually, when I've got you, well, don't go and trample the grass down and don't make the water all mucky so nobody else can actually drink or eat. God is saying to us, look, yes, I have saved you and I love everybody else just as much, even those you look down on, even those you don't think are worth saving. I actually love them as much. And so God says, yeah, okay, well, come on. I'm going to judge between the fat sheep and the scrawny sheep. Because my kingdom has a purpose. If you are loved that much, if I give everything I've got for you in Jesus, yeah, come on, you should be like that for one another. Next one, Chris, if we could. So it's really hopeful and it's really challenging. So next Sunday, Advent Sunday, we're signposting Advent. And that's a pub sign I've altered. Don't suppose I should use a pub sign in a Methodist church, but hey ho, it was there. And it was the pioneer. And I thought, yeah, come on, Jesus is our pioneer. He pioneers this way of us all being part of the God's solution, of us all being included. So we know he's going to show up. We don't know when, but we know where and with whom you're going to find Jesus if you go looking for him. So if you go looking for Jesus, where's he going to be? Does the Bible tell us? Anywhere. Anywhere with the lost? Yeah. There's a little list up there. Can you read it? Can you see? Let's just remind ourselves of where Jesus is to be found when we look for him with the same passion as he looks for us. Shall we just say that together, that list, if you can read it? destitute, hungry, afraid, hurting, lost, left out, worn down, trapped. That's where you find him, reaching out and reaching out through us that others would know the salvation that he alone can bring. Next one, Chris, if we could. So the church is purpose-driven. That single purpose, to seek and to save the lost. Anybody recognise that bit of sculpture? Anybody not been, you not been to Leeds City Art Gallery? Oh, well, there you go. Next time you're in Leeds, 
That is uh, an installation, those statues, by Jason Fujiwara. And it's called Rebecca because that's her name. And they are statues of Rebecca and there are lots of them. But what can you see about that one? Yeah. And what you can't see is that her head is also on the floor. There's a broken arm. There's a, there's a leg. There are bits of her scattered around. How would you describe Rebecca's demeanour as you look at her? She's 16, by the way. Uh, she comes from London. Uh, she was caught up in the riots in 2011. And then the artist met her. So how would you describe her demeanour? Standing like that. Determined? Stubborn? Streetwise? Angry? Purposeful? What about her sense of self? Compare her to Ellen Andre, who was the actress that Degas painted. She was a friend of his. Compare her to Ellen Andre in that painting. What do you see in her face about her self-worth? Yes. Completely different. Look at the attitude. She is standing there saying, I matter. I deserve, as a woman, to be seen. I am 16. I know my worth. Look at me. It's a wonderful piece of art. What do you think the people in the back make of it? <laughs> Not a lot. Not a lot. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus is encouraging us when he speaks in that wonderful way about sheep and goats, and actually, when I was needed, when I wanted to be seen, when I wanted to be recognised, when I wanted to know that my life mattered, where were you? Where were you? I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was thirsty. You didn't give me a drink. I was in prison. You didn't visit. I was ill. You didn't care. And Jesus makes... One of those statements that changes the world forever. It shapes our morality and our ethics forever. Because he says, as you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. As you didn't do it to Rebecca, you didn't do it to me. As you did it to me, to them, you're doing it to me. It's a statement which changes everything because Jesus says we are all sought and valued so much by God and God wants us to know that love that we should reach out to one another with that same passion. Do you see? That same passion, that same single-mindedness. Whether it's Rebecca, whether it's a refugee, whether it's a banker, it doesn't matter. God wants to rescue and save us all and God says... In one another, you will discover Jesus. So you have to reach out. You have to care. Because you're doing it for me. And the last one, Chris, if you would. Now, this is a particular favourite of mine, this last one. What do you see? Someone tied up. Absolutely. Christ the King. Tied up and bound by the church. Do you know, that's in Southwold uh, on the coast. Um, and I saw that and I thought, wow, this is the most honest church I've ever seen. <laughs> They're saying, in this church, we tie up Christ and we won't let him be who he wants to be. And I was just transfixed by it. And I thought, good gracious me, gee, I've never seen anything so honest and so wonderfully fantastically in your face as that. Christ the King, well, only a little bit. Because actually, you're going to make us care for people we'd rather ignore, and you're going to actually make us reach out and change the world when we'd rather it was just about us. And so I went inside the church thinking, wow, there's got to be something written here about why they've done that to Christ. I really want to read it. And then I discovered it's not Christ the King at all. Do you know who it is? Edmund the Martyr. 
who was t King Edmund, who was tied up and had arrows shot into him. And I was really disappointed at that point. Because I thought, oh, no, this has is, is got to be honest church. Do you want to be honest church? Yeah? So what does honest church look like if Christ is our king? What do you think? Yeah? Welcoming. Come on, push the envelope a bit. Compassionate. Accepting. Understanding. Friendly. Come on. Love. Push the envelope some more. Get uncomfortable. Spirit-led. Passionate. Challenging. Absolutely. Unbound. Christ the King can change the world. And he calls you and me to be part of that great kingdom movement. To engage with everything that's wrong. To challenge it and to put it right. Why? Because he's found us. He's found you and me. And I want other people to know what that feels like. Whether it's their social circumstances, whether it's their economic circumstances, whatever it is. I want them to know the liberation that Christ brings for them. Christ, our King, unbound. Thanks be to God.